All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Zurich. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, uh, where anyone can join in and ask any kinds of questions around websites and web search. And we can try to find some answers for you. A uh, bunch of things were submitted already. But uh, as always, if any of you want to get started with, with a question of your own that's been burning on your mind, like feel free to jump in now. I could go ahead, I guess. All right. So, Take it away. Uh, this is in regards with, uh, to uh, actual sitemap handling for very large websites. For large websites, hundreds of thousands, millions of URLs. Um, and the website is in a classified area, so there's a lot of new URLs popping up like every minute, every few seconds, something like that. So obviously, uh, there's the documentation on you know, building a sitemap. You can uh, update it dynamically as you should, and then ping Google to let them know that uh, the sitemap has been updated. What do you do when that update frequency is incredibly uh, you know, large and you know, every few seconds you get a new URL or something like that? What is the best? Is the sitemap still uh, a, good, a good way to kind of notify Google of these new URLs? Or um, given that it's not a publisher, so we cannot really use the, I, I mean, I'm not sure if we can use the news kind of sitemap because I know that's also. Uh, an option, but more for publishers. So what would be the best practice here? You, you can definitely still use a sitemap, or you can use an RSS feed. Um, I, I think those are kind of the, the directions I would go. The, the one thing I would try to do is maybe split it up into parts where you have the, the recent content and kind of the more stable or longer form content so that you don't have to submit all of your sitemap files every time there's a change, so that you have something like a, a sitemap file for the last day or for the last couple hours, and you just resubmit that one when, when there are updates that are happening. And then over time, when, when a URL stays around for longer, you can move it to one of the more stable sitemap files on your, on your site. But essentially, you have kind of one smaller file that you submit with the regular updates. With an RSS feed, that kind of happens automatically because the, the RSS feed only has the last couple updates in it. And uh, with the RSS feed, you can push those to Google as well with um, what is it, PubSub, PubUp, or Web Push, what it's called now, uh, to, to kind of send those updates a little bit faster. But that's kind of the direction I'd go. I wouldn't try to update all sitemap files all the time and just like send all of them again, because that's too much work on your side. And it's like we, we process all of the millions of URLs, and we only find 25 that are new. So you might as well just send us those new ones separately. OK, uh, so what would be a, uh, you know, a good a uh, good minimum frequency uh, for these kind of new URLs. Again, given that we might have like 50 URLs a minute or something like that, 50 new URLs a minute. I don't know. I, I would submit them once a minute, maybe, one, once every couple of minutes, something, something like that, so that you, you have a reasonable set, but you're not like polling Google constantly with, with submissions. And the other one can be like once a day or some of the bigger one. Once sure. Day. Yeah. Uh, and regarding the bigger one, uh, that will likely also have a lot of, you know, classified ads that are expiring, so they're no longer available. Uh, is that fine uh, if they're still in the sitemap, of, you know, for that day, uh, and they disappear the day the day after? So that's not yeah. a big, big problem. For yeah. Google. I. I think, especially with classifieds, which have a specific runtime, I would use the unavailable after meta tag uh, to let us know that this is something that will be valid for the next week or whatever. And then that's something that we can take into account a little bit faster uh, rather than having to kind of refresh every page and then check for the no index. OK. so. Uh... You know, if you had to choose between the sitemap, the sitemap version and the RSS version, well, is there any benefit to either? I don't see any big advantage either way. 
Yeah. It's okay. like well, whatever well, is easier for you to generate. That's kind of what I, what yeah. I would focus on. We'll try oh, one of the versions, see how it works out, and take it from okay. there. OK. Thanks. Cool. John, I have a, a tangential question on that, particularly to the unavailable after. Um, I, I work in the automotive industry, and we're seeing a lot of vehicle detail pages that remain on the website long after the vehicle has sold. Um, and then it's it's kind of muddying the waters because um, each of those product pages essentially has the brand, the, the, the manufacturer and the make, or sorry, the make and the model of each one. And so we're ranking for those make model keywords. If we were to put an unavailable after, say, a week from today, um, would the crawler come back and check to see if it's changed before it hits that date? And if, if we change the unavailable after date to then extend it, would that, could, could we roll that so sure. that, okay, awesome. Yeah, that, that, that should work, yeah. I mean, you, you can definitely change the unavailable after date. And if we recrawl that page then and we see that it's still there, then like, we'll, we'll still keep it in. So I think that might be an option. Um, in general, though, with, with a lot of these things, I think you have to assume that sometimes we will try to send people to a page that doesn't exist anymore. So catching that in some kind of a, a user-friendly way is, is also very important. We have, we have redirects that go to a search result page or, or a soft 404, um, yeah. or 404 afterwards. So there, there is a fallback. I just want to make sure that we have uh, the, the most efficient line of defense first. And then if that fails, then we have a fail safe and that it would all still be customer um, kind of approved and friendly. That sounds good. Cool. Hi, John Arnoldo here. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm calling um, in relation with a case we have opened uh, for, for IKEA in a previous uh, session uh, or agency in Germany. Uh, they um, they contact you through through this uh, forum. Um, so now we we are in a process of cleaning out basically a lot of old uh, uh, content. You know, we are just doing a, a clean up. Um, but we still see that Google uh, ignore the uh, German uh, language uh, version and uh, rank the uh, the Austrian. And then in, in Search Console, we see also that uh, the referral pages are like third party external um, spammy domains, uh, which is uh, weird. And th that is the behavior that we see. Um, but we've been doing uh, uh, basically checking all the basic stuff and uh, we still see that uh, Google don't don't catch the, the German version yet. Yeah, so sometimes these things take a while to settle down. So especially if, if there used to be or if there still is the same content in the same language on multiple URLs, then it can happen that we pick one of the country versions as the canonical and we show that one in the search results. But yeah. I, I think I looked at it uh, with the team after the, the last Hangout where, where this was mentioned. And it sounded like that's something that the team is looking into to see if, if we can speed that up in general so yes. that it doesn't the, the order, the last this long for sites yeah, in the future. Order, yeah, I understand. Thanks. The, the other behavior that we see is that um, Google is is actually showing on SERPs like old uh, platform like uh, URLs like uh, sites that we migrated since two years ago and then also back in March we did another migration so it, it looks like you guys uh, uh, keep these old URLs as a, as a fallback or why why is that happening? Um, I I don't know which which exact URLs you're looking at, but in general, this there, there are two two main reasons when when this happens. Uh, on the one hand, when the canonicalization from our point of view is not completely clear, 
Uh, so if we're not perfectly sure which one of these URLs from, from the set of pages that, that we think belong together is the right one to show, then that's something where we might pick one which you think is like an older one or that we shouldn't have picked. And that's something where we, we use a lot of different signals to try to figure out which, which of these pages to show. And sometimes if those signals don't match, then we have to kind of make a judgment call, or rather our algorithms do that. So that's, that's the one thing. And the other time that, that I see this happening fairly frequently is if you explicitly look for the old content. Uh, so I, do, I don't know if that's, that's what you're seeing. But uh, for example, if you move from one domain to another and you do a site colon query for the old domain or you search explicitly for the old domain or the old brand name or something like that, then we'll still show you the old domain even though we've moved everything over to the new domain. And that's something that can happen for, I think, several years in, in going forward, where, or like from, from the past, where if you yeah. search for something that has moved a couple of years ago and we think you're explicitly looking for that, then we'll try to show it to you because we're trying to be helpful. But uh, yeah. from kind of an SEO point of view, from an analytics and tracking point of view, you don't want Google to be helpful. You want to see the kind of new thing. Uh, but that's some, sometimes uh, the confusing setup that happens. And if they're redirect setup from the old one to the new one, then even if users see the old one in search, they'll make it to the new one. And it's yes. not that the ranking would be any different if we pick the new URL by default. Would you recommend, right now we have the hreflang uh, implementation on the sitemaps. Um, would, would it help? To have it on the on the uh, on the page, or it will not make any any difference. It wouldn't make any difference uh, if we see it in the sitemap and it's the the right URLs in the sitemap file. That's exactly the same from our point of view as if it's on the page. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll uh, keep joining here and see how this develops. Thank you for for your cool. answers. Thanks. John, in a in a space where you've switched domains, would clearing the cache then remove those index pages from the previous domain? No. So, so I assume you mean the kind of the uh, removing the cache tool in Search Console. Yes. Yeah. No, that wouldn't change anything. That's basically it. Just hides the cache page from the search results and removes the snippet. It wouldn't change anything from the indexing side. Uh, in general, the URL removal and the cache uh, kind of update tool, they don't change anything from indexing. They just try to kind of like apply a Band-Aid in the search results when someone searches for it. OK. Would removing the domain, the, the old domain, like completely shutting it down, then remove the results for the old domain? Yes. It it would remove those results, but it would also prevent you from getting any of the traffic if we accidentally sent people to the old domain. So that's something where I, I would recommend just keeping the redirect up. And uh, that's something we'll, over time we'll pick that up. Um, the, the tricky part I've seen is when, when you change your domain name and people used to search for your domain name specifically, uh, because maybe the domain name is almost like a part of your brand, then those are cases where if someone searches for the old domain name, we'll still show the old domain name. Uh, but if you look at the cache page for that URL, then oftentimes you'll see we've actually indexed the new version. We're just showing the old URL in the search results, because we think that's what, what people were looking for. Does it does it maintain the old metadata, the old title description, or will it appropriate the new domain title and description? Yeah, it takes everything from the new domain. So if we've switched indexing to the new one and we just show the old URL, then all of indexing is based on the new one. The ranking is based on the new one, all of that. So it's really just the URL that's shown in the search results. OK, um, let me run through some of the submitted questions. And if you have more questions along the way, feel free to jump on in. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time towards the end as well to go through some other live questions. Uh, so some of these are pretty long. I'll try to shorten them a little bit. 
Um, the first one is we have over 3,000 articles in our help section, and we want to make them available in 25 languages. Uh, would using the Cloud Translation API hurt our website? Um, so of course, we would use the Translation API markup and warnings. Um, would these articles be considered low quality? Is that like too many articles? Like we, we can't do this manually. Um, so first, first of all, I, I was not aware of the translation API markup. Uh, I looked that up. That's, that was pretty interesting to see. Uh, that's kind of an, a lang attribute that you can add to the pages or to elements on a page when they're machine translated, which helps our systems to understand that this is actually machine translated content. We shouldn't use it to learn further translations. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so from, from a purely technical point of view, there's a bit of a, a split, I would say, within Google with regards to what we'd recommend doing there. On the one hand, from the, the Webmaster Guidelines point of view, we, we might consider this to be automatically generated content. And we'd say, well, you shouldn't allow automatically generated content to be indexed, uh, especially if it's lower quality content. I think with machine translation, it's kind of reaching a point where machine translations are actually pretty good. And it's no longer the case that machine translated content reads like gibberish, and you can barely guess what the meaning is. But actually, it's fairly reasonable translation. Uh, so from that point of view, you could argue either way and say, well, this kind of content is reasonable enough for me to stand behind as something that I would publish on my website. And in that case, that might be an option for you to say, well, I'll take these and run it over the articles that I have and generate it for the languages that I think are important for our users. Uh, that might be something to take a look at. On the other hand, uh, especially when we look at the quality of a website overall, we, we do look at the quality overall. And if you're taking 100,000 articles and you're running translations in 25 languages over it, then it's going to be really hard for you to confirm that the quality that you're generating like this is actually high enough that you'd be able to stand behind it and say, well, this is what I want my website to be known for. So that's something where I would take this step by step and uh, think about it incrementally, try things out. Test some languages where you have testers who can help you to double check that the localization is really actually useful translation and not just like you can kind of guess what the meaning is translation. And if you can determine that those languages for specific articles on your website are actually pretty good, then that might be something you'd want to set to be indexable. On the other hand, if you're really unsure if this is something that you want to have index for your website to kind of stand behind, then that's something where you, maybe you'll set it to no index, or you'll use just the JavaScript widget so that it doesn't generate any separate pages for, for your website. So that's something where there isn't this by default behavior that we would say, oh, if you use this kind of translation, then we'll think your website is really fantastic. But really, you need to double check that yourself. And that's something that's sometimes a bit hard to do. So just blindly going and saying, I have 100,000 articles, and I want 25 languages, and hitting the button to generate all of those, that's probably not the right approach. But rather, you want to take this step by step and make sure that you're actually creating something that is useful for your users that doesn't come across as gibberish, where if they come to your website and they see this localized version, they're like, this doesn't make any sense. This website is more like spam rather than actually something reasonable. Um, our website focuses on troubleshooting. And I often find links getting posted on forums with foreign language or non-English forums. They're all relevant posts. Is it negative in the eyes of Google? The language on my website is 100% English. Uh, so that might be perfectly fine. Just because people in other languages are referring to your content doesn't mean that that's necessarily bad. Uh, I, I think, in general, that's, that's actually a good sign. If you're creating something so useful that people refer to it, even if it's not in their own language, then that's usually a good sign. Uh, so from that point of view, I wouldn't worry about this, but rather see it as a kind of a positive thing. Uh, it might even be something where you go further and say, well, 
lots of people in these specific languages are referring to my content. Maybe I can do something on my website to cater my content better to them even. Um, but it's definitely not something where you'd look at it and say, well, these links are coming from foreign websites. Therefore, I need to disavow them, or I need to block them somehow. Um, it's perfectly fine and natural to get links from all kinds of websites. Um, then, yes. A question. It's sure. more of a measurement question. In Search Console, we have a client that has uh, redirection based on IP. Uh, so when they, someone searches for their brand, they will be redirected to sometimes even a different domain uh, than the one showing in the search results. Where is the click counted? Where, like where, it, where is it counted? Um, so if we show something in the search results, then we would track that there in Search Console. So Search Console itself wouldn't know what happens after someone clicks on a page in, in the search results. Uh, in analytics, you might see that differently. Uh, if you're tracking kind of the user-facing analytics, then that might be different. But in Search Console, that would refer just to what we show in the search results and which ones people clicked on there. OK. The, like, the problem is that uh, I can tell you the search term is HBO. And we're working with HBO Nordics. The first result when you search for HBO from Sweden is HBO.com. We think most of the users click there, but Search Console data shows like over 50% uh, click through rate on the Nordic domain, the HBO Nordics domain. So it feels like kind of strange to have people clicking on the second result when the first one is what they're searching for. Is it possible that it's double counted on? No, that, that shouldn't be double counted or, or anything like that. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know the query and which languages you're seeing this in. But what, what can sometimes happen is that we show an English uh, search result for something generic like that, as well as a local search result. And uh, it might be that users are just seeing, oh, this English result and kind of the result in my own language, and they click on their own language version. Um, because it's, okay. it's kind of tricky with, with a query like HBO, where we wouldn't be able to tell which, which language the user is actually searching yeah. in. OK. Sure. Thanks. That might also be something where using hreflang would, would help you. Um, because then we, we would be able to take the user's language settings and try to show the right version of that site. And that's something that you could do, for example, just for the home page or separately for the home page from the rest of the site uh, so that for queries which are very generic, we'd be more likely able to show the version that matches the user's language directly. OK. Thanks. Sure. All right, and now kind of a structured data question, or I guess a tricky one. Um, so when you search for a half dome tent, the top result is the old product page, which includes a call out to kind of see the new version. And uh, there's also canonical on that page pointing to the new version of the product. Uh, and I think the question kind of goes into would using structured data in any way help to kind of show the newer version rather than the older version? And I, I took a quick look at some of the URLs that are involved uh, with, with this. And essentially, what is happening is, on the one hand, we, we struggle to see the connection between the old URL and the new one, because it's not that clear of a situation that the these URLs are exactly the same content. So that's something for from canonicalization. We we're kind of unsure if these actually belong together. And the other part that's coming together here is that for canonicalization, we use a number of signals. So we do use the rel canonical on the page, uh, which is something that's specified well here. Uh, but we also use things like internal linking, external linking, sitemap files, all, all kinds of other sources as well. And I assume if you take a URL that is fairly well established and you create a second URL with a product that kind of replaces the first one, 
then that established URL is going to remain visible in the search results for quite some time uh, until we've really learned that the new URL is kind of the, the better version for these kind of search results. So that's something where structured data probably wouldn't change anything there. So in particular, using something like successor of or predecessor of, that wouldn't change anything from our point of view. Uh, it's really just that canonicalization decision where we have a lot of kind of collected signals for the old URL and not really a ton of good signals for the new URL. And we, we struggle to connect those two completely. Uh, one thing you could do is redirect from the old version to the new one. That would help us to figure this out a lot faster. Uh, but at the same time, if you want the old product to, be, to remain available in the sense that if people search for the old product, they can find replacement parts or kind of find manuals, those kind of things, then you don't want to completely remove the old product. Uh, the solution that we generally recommend for this general kind of pro problem where you have one product and then you have a replacement for that product is to reuse the old product URL uh, for the new product and move the old product content to kind of an archive section. Uh, that way, you kind of build upon the success of your old URL. And you add the new content there, kind of the new product, the new product description, uh, new pricing, or whatever you have. And you still have the old product information. And you just move the old product information to an archive section where it's a little bit less uh, less visible, kind of less, less strongly shown in the search results because it's a new URL. Uh, so that's kind of the general situation or general direction that we would head with something like this. Uh, I imagine for e-commerce sites, that's really kind of tricky uh, because it's hard to kind of like move one product to an archive section and reuse the old URL with maybe an article ID and things like that that are associated with it. Um, but that's generally the direction that we would go. We, we would also use this for recurring events. Uh, so if you have something like a yearly conference, then instead of creating new URLs for every year, then have instead use one stable URL for the conference and move the previous years to an archive section. So that kind of in both of these situations, you're building a stronger and stronger URL for the persistent version for that product. And you're moving the old things off to URLs which are a little bit weaker within your website so that they're less empathized in search. And structured data, I don't think structured data would play a role here at all. So using kind of this setup with, with regards to structured data of kind of like saying, well, these are connected like this, that's not something that we would use at all for this kind of canonicalization or figuring out which one of these URLs is the one to show at the moment. Uh, hey, John. John quick oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask a structured data question. I thought I put it in the comments, and I'm not seeing it anymore. <clears throat> um, so I noticed that some of the Google structured data requirements can be a little bit um, there, there can be more requirements there than what schema.org schema requires. So uh, I work for an educational institution, and we want to have content structured data around that, that talks to our degree programs, especially for use in Google colleges and universities. But I noticed that in the structured data um, list, there really doesn't seem to be a good type for full degrees. In fact, some of your structured data types specifically say it's not for full degrees. Um, do you have any recommendations there, especially given that sometimes when we test out some of the schema.org structured data types, we get notification from, from Search Console that, hey, this thing is not parsable because it's not actually Google's structured data type? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know specifically about that, that kind of structured data. But the in general, it's, it's certainly the case that within schema.org, there's a lot more structured data that's available. And we, we only take a small subset of that and use that directly for the rich results and the search results. Um, if you use other parts of schema.org, which we wouldn't use in, in the rich results, we would still try to understand that. But it's not that we would 
show it in any particular way in the search results. So uh, kind of going past what we would use directly is, is certainly an option. Uh, but I think for the most part, you wouldn't get any visible effect from that. Uh, so that's ki kind of the, the starting point there. Within the structured data testing tool, I believe the structured data testing tool um, sticks a little bit stricter or aligns more with the schema.org markup. And the rich results test is really based on how Google would show that in the search results. So it only uses a subset uh, of kind of the, the general structured data that we would find. Um, with regards to which one to best use in, in a case like yours, I don't know offhand. There's so many different types. Uh, but I, I would generally um, try to, first, first of all, see if there's a type that is actually shown in the search results that matches what you're trying to achieve, and then focus on that, which would be what we would have documented in the developer documentation for search. And if there's nothing there that works for you, then you can use the schema.org markup. Uh, but I wouldn't expect a lot of visible results from that. So uh, in particular, we'd use this to better understand those pages. But if we can al already understand that this is kind of like a course or there is information about an educational uh, setup thing here, then that's something we probably already have that information. And we don't need a lot more information about that to be able to show those pages in search, uh, because we're already mapping them to the right query. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah, if I think it's kind so of good. ambiguous, then that's something where extra structured data helps us a little bit. Yeah, I think I was really thinking about it, especially in terms of Google colleges and universities, assuming that there would be a heavier reliance on structured data for, for that um, application within Google. And I didn't know if that was something that, I, in my research, I haven't found anything that specifically says yes, but I kind of made that assumption that that would be used moving forward. I don't know. So <laughs> I, I think so. So the tricky part is I think that's something that we only show in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's something where I like if I, I don't see them in search, then it's really hard to get some firsthand experience with that. Um, but uh, I I don't know exactly how we would show that or where we would get that from. Um, but that's something where if it's not documented in our developer documentation, then I'd assume that. We, we don't use the structured data there directly. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Sure. OK. Um, is it true? Oh, go for it, Mihai. I had a quick uh, follow up to that uh, example you gave earlier with the uh, products being. Um, uh, same URL being reused for products that you know, get out of stock and things like that, events. Uh, I was also thinking about how you would apply that to the classified sites example I gave earlier. Would you be able to do something similar, given that most URLs um, are being created by actual users? Uh, so it's user-generated content. But it's likely that a lot of ads are very similar in what they have to offer. Uh, so when one expires, would it be possible to, uh, I don't know, maybe redirect or use a real canonical to uh, add a an ad from a different user that basically sells the same product or service? Would that be? Uh, yeah, I I think fun. that might be a bit confusing for users, but having something like tag pages or category pages that. That seems like something that would work better, where if you have like a category page for this brand of car and you kind of swap out the, the classified ads that you have um, so that this category page remains relevant for the long run, then that's something that, that we could probably pick up on and use like that. But for the individual classified ads, that seems tricky to determine that connection. Uh, so it's very easy to say, like, oh, based on this one keyword and the old classified and the new one, I will just redirect it to something else. I could imagine that gets a bit confusing. Yeah, yeah could be. Yeah, so having uh, like sort of listings or category or tag pages is probably a better a better way to kind of target those 
Yeah. Uh, back of that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. John, a question for you about linking from those category pages um, and putting a, a relational tag on the links themselves. Uh, because it's user generated content, would you recommend putting the UGC re relation from the category page to the actual description page? Or is the UGC tag irrelevant? I, I wouldn't use it there because you're kind of linking to your own content. And within the classified ads of users add links, then that's something where I'd use the rel UGC. Uh, so it's not kind of for situations where you're linking to user-generated content, but rather where the user-generated content links to other places. Great, thank you. OK. Um, and now an HTML5 question. Is it true that HTML5 semantic tags, like main, article, et cetera, are very important? Uh, one SEO expert said that HTML5 structure is used by Google for fast understanding of the page content uh, before analyzing hundreds of other factors. Um, so we, we do try to understand the structure of a page, but we can understand the structure of a page in lots of different ways. So it's not that HTML5 uh, kind of sec section tags are something that we would use specifically when it comes to SEO. And it's not that you have a ranking advantage over other sites if you use things like main or article elements within your pages. So like, I think it's good to use proper HTML in general so that it's, it's a clear page. It works well on lots of browsers. It works well uh, for users with disabilities. Uh, but it's not something that, from an SEO point of view, we will take into account. And one of the reasons why this is sometimes this is kind of the case is that kind of these technical details are things that users often don't even know. And it wouldn't make sense for us to, to rank pages based on things that, that are essentially not noticeable by users in that sense. So that's something where you might load a page, and it uses an old table-based layout, and it hasn't been updated in 10 years, but it's still the right content, relevant content for the query that you are looking for. It wouldn't make sense for us to say, well, this other page has content that's kind of OK as well, and it uses HTML5 properly. Therefore, it must be a much better, better result for users. That's definitely not the case. Uh, so I think it's good to focus on clean HTML. It makes things a lot easier for your site in general. But I wouldn't see this as a primary SEO ranking factor in that. If you're struggling with ranking, you need to fix your HTML markup, because in general, that's not going to change anything when it comes to ranking. Um, oh, wow. And long question, I think, with regards to purchasing website. Can you explain the situation that happens when you purchase an established website, uh, merge most of the content into your existing website, and then 301 from the purchase website's pages to the migrated content? Uh, in principle, I would have thought that the final single website would be some of its parts. Uh, however, I've assumed that this is maybe far from the case. Uh, yeah, so in general, moving from one domain to another is something that's fairly straightforward in that we can take all of the old signals and forward it to a new domain. Uh, that's kind of the, the simple part of a site move. Um, similarly, if you move from HTTP to HTTPS, that's something we can just take everything one to one and pass it on to the next, uh, next setup, the next domain, kind of the next protocol version. Uh, that's essentially the, the straightforward type of site move. Uh, but as soon as you do things like uh, restructuring a website within the same website, like merging multiple websites into one website, splitting one website into multiple separate websites, that's where it gets a lot more complicated. And that's where, essentially, our algorithms have to reprocess the whole website and understand what is this new website that we have, or these new multiple websites, if, if it's split into multiple websites, and how do they fit in with regards to the rest of the general ecosystem on the web? How should we understand how relevant some of this content is? Uh, which of these pages can be kind of 
understood a little bit better with the new configuration, and which of these pages might be harder to understand with the new configuration. And that's a process that can take a significant amount of time. Uh, so in general, if you're looking at various changes on our website, and one of the options is, oh, I will restructure everything, or I will merge multiple websites, or split one website into multiple websites, then it's good to keep in mind that those are long-term changes that will take a lot of time to be reprocessed. Uh, you might see this as something that kind of slowly goes from one state into the other. You might also see it as something where it's like we start to see this complete restructuring, and then we say, oh my god, everything is different. We have to be careful here and try to understand this new website first, where you see a significant dip uh, until we're able to kind of stabilize on a new kind of better understanding of the website in general. So that's something which is really hard to predict ahead of time, uh, how these things will happen. I think it's just important as a site owner that if you're considering any of op these options, that these are things that will take a lot of time and where you may see significant changes and fluctuations until things settle down into a more stable state. And that stable state doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be the same as before, in that if you restructure a website significantly within the same website, you might see better results later on because you have a cleaner structure. Uh, similarly, you might see worse results because maybe the new structure is worse. Uh, if you merge multiple websites, it might be that you have kind of a stronger visibility in the search results. But it might also mean that, well, you're merging multiple things, and they're kind of merging in ways that are clashing with, with each other, uh, which are resulting in kind of a similar search visibility to before, where you had multiple websites showing. Now you have one website showing, but it's kind of shown in a similar way in the search results. So this is something where it's really hard to predict ahead of time what exactly will happen. And it's definitely not the case that you can just blindly assume that this one plus that one will equal the new one, uh, because you're creating a completely new website, which we have to essentially understand completely first. So that's something where it's like I'm not saying like nobody should do these kind of moves. Sometimes you have to do them just because you, things are changing within your business. Uh, but it's, it's good to kind of be cautious about these kind of moves, and especially to see this as something that you don't want to do just to try it out and see what happens. So if you're aware of one of these moves needing to be done in the future, then try to kind of like, do that in one step so that you have everything moved over to the final state so that you don't run into a situation where it's like, oh, I will merge everything first, and then I will split it off again, and then maybe I'll restructure part of this again. Because all of those individual changes, they, they will require a significant amount of time on their own. So ideally, try to find the stable approach that you can keep for the long run and focus on moving things over to that. Um, is Zulu time for a news sitemap? OK. So particular with regards to publication date. Uh, so Zulu time is if you have a Z at the end of the time, uh, which is essentially, I, I had to look it up. It's uh, kind of, what is it, uh, GMT time. So essentially a specific time zone. Which, which it refers to. Uh, from our point of view, using a specified time zone, like if you have plus and then a number of hours or minus and a number of hours is fine. Using the, the Zulu time is also fine. Those are both well-defined time formats that work well for us. So they're equivalent from our point of view. Uh, the examples that you have in, in the question um, are not quite equivalent because they're different times and different days. Uh, but essentially, you can you can use either one of these formats. You can also use some URLs with with the Zulu time, some with the the offset. That's totally up to you. Uh, the one thing I would watch out for here is to try to be as consistent as possible, so that you don't end up in a situation where you specify one time in the sitemap and use a different time zone on the pages themselves. So that's something that we sometimes see, 
especially when it comes to news content. On the pages themselves in the news article, you can also specify a time. Uh, if you specify the wrong time zone in one of these places, then we'll be kind of conflicted. Or if you specify the time zone in one of the places and you don't specify the time zone in the other place, then that's also one of those situations where we don't perfectly know what you mean. So if you're using any way of specifying the time zone, then I would make sure to be consistent across your website so that it's really perfectly clear to us when we look at your pages, this is the exact point in time that you're referring to. Not that we have to guess, like, oh, the server is located in this place. Therefore, probably they mean this time zone. So we'll guess that that's the case. Really kind of be as clear as possible if you want to specify something like this. Uh, we use Data Studio for several reportings. Now we recognize that URL impressions plus click-through rate, and sometimes not even URL clicks sum up as visible in Search Console. Uh, how is this possible? What are we doing wrong? Is it possible uh, to get the correct data in Data Studio? Uh, so I, I think there, there are a few things that are possibly happening here. It's hard to say exactly uh, what you're seeing. Uh, so on the one hand, the fresh data currently isn't visible in, in the APIs and appropriately not in the Data Studio. Uh, that, that is, I think that's also based on the API. Uh, so if you're looking at things from today uh, that kind of happened in the last week, for example, in the performance report in Search Console, then that would not match what you would see in the API. Uh, we're looking at ways that we can add kind of the fresh data to the API as well uh, in, in ways that don't confuse the, the consumers of the API. Because one of the tricky parts with the fresh data in Search Console is that this is data that's not really finalized yet, where it might be that we, we have to clean things up. And that's something that happens in the pipelines along the way. Uh, so sometimes you'll see the, the fresh data like shows this many clicks and impressions for a period of time. If you look at that a few days later, you'll see a different number there. That's just because that, that data has been finalized at that point. And if we were just to blindly inject the fresh data into the API as well, then all of those people who are always trying to get the newest data with the API, they would be working with the fresh data, which could end up in situations where that data has even stronger mismatch to what is shown long term in Search Console. So we're, we're trying to find a way to make that a little bit easier. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the aggregation of the counts that are shown above the table in the performance reports and the, the individual rows which are shown are aggregated separately. So it can happen in situations uh, where the count on top is slightly higher than the count if you add up all of the rows. Sometimes that's due to kind of the privacy filtering. Sometimes that's just due to the way that we aggregate the data. In general, the higher count is the more accurate one. So if you see a higher count in the, t in the sum above, then that's the one that I would focus on. If you see a higher count in the rows shown below, then that's what I would focus on. Um, but that's something where kind of the different aggregation uh, methods that are used in Search Console, they can be a bit confusing in the UI sometimes. We regularly have people ask us about that. Uh, but they're certainly also confusing if you're using the API and comparing like the API results to one of those sets, either the numbers on top or the rows that are shown. Uh, so that's something where you might see differences because of that. Um, that's actually a good uh, support, official support article on how uh, aggregation works, the property aggregation versus uh, page aggregation, if you take the rows and just look at the pages. So uh, I found that to be useful as well. Oh, yeah. Definitely, yeah. That's that's the the other point, which also makes it tricky. Like the property and the URL and the query aggregation are sometimes a little bit different as well. Um, it gets really hard when you have a lot of data, and all of these aggregations, they they become pretty tricky, uh, especially for for larger sites. And one one place where I've seen the differences more visibly is if you have a larger site and you look at a very small section of that site, then kind of because those small numbers are 
bit uh, kind of out of the aggregate from the larger site, you might see bigger percent-wise changes there. Oh, wow. We're kind of running towards the end of time. So I'll maybe shift things over to, to questions from you all uh, before I have to jump out of the room here. Yeah, hi, John. Um, just a quick question about um, URL inspect in Google Search Console. The thing here is that um, because we actually have been uh, through a couple of migration, so we take the same product URL and tested it. And then we found out that the current page that we have live doesn't have any um, canonical URL um, from Google. But the rest are pointing to a URL that doesn't really exist. So, so what, what is pointing to a URL? So it's pretty much the same URL that is live without a trailing slash. So it get the 301 redirect. So we don't really know how Google come about in picking that URL to start with because it's never used on the site. Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say without looking at a specific example. If, if you want uh -huh. to copy the URL into the chat here, I can take a look at that afterwards. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, I can do that. OK, cool. Yeah, yeah super. And just a very quick question, another one. On um, referring page, also in URL inspect, so we noticed that there is um, we are getting a a referring page from a different domain that um, seems like a spammy domain that are redirecting a couple of times to our page. Um, and Google actually referred that as a referring page. Um, shouldn't Google only pick the referring page within um, the our domain only? No. we. If, if we can pick up a URL from other sources, we might show that too. Um, but it's not, it's not going to be the case that this is negatively affecting your website because it's like some spammy domain that's linking to your website. But rather, it's just we, we happen to have initially found the URL there, and we, we started crawling from there. So it's not, it's not a sign of any kind of quality issue there. It's, it's more from a technical point of view, we found it, and we, we picked up on it and tried to index it like that. OK, but if we disavow it, for example, that then wouldn't be... change. That wouldn't change anything for those URLs that we've already seen, um, because once we've seen URLs from your website, we've indexed them and noticed that we can index them, then we'll continue to try to index them. Um, if you disavow it, it basically just tells us we shouldn't be passing any signals to that URL. But from, from purely an indexing point of view, from the inspect URL point of view, that would probably remain there. All right, then, yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, hello? Hi. Yes, um, um, uh, I'm uh, running um, a movie website, and we've been working with the Shima.org review for quite some time, and it worked uh, for like two or three years. But after the recent Google update, we, we keep getting warnings in our Google Search Console that the review item is not supported. Um, even if the markup is correct in the rich uh, results test. And I was just wondering, before we change 900 reviews, uh, what should we do? Um, is, is there any uh, thing for movie websites that are not selling anything but are just reviewing movies? I don't know offhand. But uh, I, I do know with, with regards to the, I believe it's the review markup or one of the other types of structured data markups, we started sending out more more warnings about situations where we see that websites are using it incorrectly. Uh, so it's not that there's going to be a manual action and we're going to uh, like block these, but more it's just, well, this isn't aligned with our guidelines, so we want to let you know that this currently isn't supported like that. And the, I would focus on the documentation that we have on the developer's guide and see if there's a type that matches what, what you're doing. But I don't know if we would have something specific for movie sites, for example. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. I need to take a break here. Uh, someone waiting for the room. So thank you all for joining in. Uh, the next one in English, I think, will be on Friday. And on Thursday, we have another one in German lined up. So if you're keen on joining, feel free to jump in there. Thanks again for dropping by, and hope to see you in one of the future ones. Bye, everyone.